Our next speaker on the panel today is Dr. Pankaj Arora, Associate Professor from uh, Department of Hospital Administration, PGI MER Chandigarh. Um, he's a seasoned academician of repute. He has authored more than 35 articles in various peer reviewed journals, along with authoring over 10 chapters in various books. He's a member of the expert group, uh, National Expert Group on Patient Safety. He's also been a member of the committee that brought about the revised IPHS guidelines in 2022. A very warm welcome, Dr. Aurora. We are privileged to have you on our platform today. And all our participants look forward to hearing you speak on life cycle of BME know-how. Thank you, sir, for being here with us today. And I hand it over to you. Thank you, so And I'll try to see what, because I'm working in a public sector hospital and my primary experience is how the government procurement works but I also have a bit of taste of the corporate sector and I'll try to see how both of them differ and both of them have their some sort of concurrence also. So uh, as uh, Professor Anyal mentioned, this is the uh, procurement cycle demand. Then you have specifications, tender or whatever bidding process you undertake, receipt and installation, condemnation, and obviously the audit and all those things. So I'll, I'll just uh, say these two uh, proverbs probably, uh, I always use these whenever I discuss this procurement cycle. Well planned is half done. I mean, the more you perspire during peace, the less you bleed during war. And that is the most important part in the planning cycle also, or in the procurement cycle also. Usually what we have seen is that people do not plan well, and they later on they lament that they have got a bad equipment or a bad supply. And I believe that time should be reversed. A lot of time is spent on tendering process, on the uh, technical evaluation and all those things. However, the less or a very minimal amount of time is spent on the first part of the procurement cycle, that is the specifications. And I believe that the specification is the key to the success of any procurement procedure. Because if you look at the procurement procedure, at least from a public sector perspective, the steps further down the specification part, that is the tendering process, the receipt process, the uh, installation process, more or less this has been codified either by the general financial rules, by the central government or the state financial rules. But this part is left to the user or the stakeholder. And this is where probably we lack a knowledge. And because, because the rest is codified, rest has been scrutinized so often by the finance departments, the audit parties that we are very afraid of that we may not have any problem in our tendering process. However, the key to the success of any tender or any procurement is the specification. And this is where we often falter. We all know what our specifications is, but this is just a definition, just to recap. It's a document describing the buyer's needs which enables providers to propose an appropriate estimate to meet those needs. These are written guidelines that precisely define the operational, physical, and or chemical characteristics, as well as the quality and quantity of a particular item to be procured. Now, these are the key questions when we, when we discuss this topic of specifications. But before that, there has to be a word or two on the demand. A lot of times the, we have seen, and that is there true for the specifications also, the demand is not the actual demand. It is a demand which is driven by the market. Market forces can create those demands. Marketeers do not create needs, but marketeers creates demands. And this is what happens in a lot of places where probably we do not need a particular equipment, but because there is so much pressure from market that a demand is generated, created. So we have to be very careful whenever we are looking to buy a new equipment because we know that there is the this resources are scarce and we have to balance what is the best resource and what is its best utilization. So now, once we have decided what we need to buy, then what we need to know is what is the specification. And here I believe that I'll compare the two things and see what, what happens in a public sector and what happens in corporate sector. In a public sector, we often lament that the we do not get the best quality of the equipment or best quality of the consumables. 
And the reason that probably uh, most of us ascribe to it is because we are forced to buy from the lowest bidder. But I believe that the lowest bidder is not the problem. The problem is that we do not spend time on drafting our specifications. And because we do not draft good specifications, we are not able to get the kind of equipment or the quality of equipment that we want to buy. I mean, for example, I'll just give you two examples. Uh, very commonly, it is seen the latest, these two words are inserted in our specifications, latest technology and best quality. I mean, how do you describe something like a latest technology? What you have prescribed today may not, may become uh, obsolete tomorrow. Or what is the best? I mean, best may differ from a place to place. For a small uh, 50 bedded hospital, something else may be required, but for a 5,000 bedded medical university, something else may be the best. So we should avoid these words. And that is where I say the time spent on specifications is most important. It's sitting in the public sector, we believe that the corporate sector do not face this problem of L1 or the lowest bidder. But on the contrary, the corporate sector is not out there to splurge money on everything and anything because they are also concerned about their PL statements. So I believe that they also scrutinize everything that they are going to purchase and probably even with a more, uh, much more glare in, of all the people, including the finance, that where every penny is going. While that may not be always the case in public sector, where sometimes we do see odd cases where uh, things which are not exactly required are bought. So I think this is a myth that we buy in a public sector inferior quality or not so satisfactory quality of equipments because of the L1 problem. And once we are, once we are clear in our mind that it is not the L1 which determines the quality, it is our specifications which determine, our, determine the quality of the product that we finally buy or achieve or able to buy, then the next question is who and how of specifications? Who should draft the specifications? Usually it is the, it is the uh, user who is supposed to draw the specifications. And rightfully so, because I know what do I require. For example, whatever you want to buy for yourself, you know what you require. However, I may not be the most competent person to draft specifications for each and everything. I mean, sharing my own experience, I am looking after the uh, uh, central stores of my institute for almost past 10 years. And the kind of inventory that a hospital maintains, I mean, the variety that hospital maintains, I cannot single-handedly decide the specifications of every single item that we purchase. And so is the case with any other human being tasked to frame the specifications. For a complicated biomedical equipment, I would like to have the help of a biomedical engineer, the IT guy, my colleagues in other places, and so and so forth. I mean, even the, the, the engineers where this equipment is going to be installed, what is kind of electrical supply that is required. For all these things, I may be requiring help from many other people. So I should not hesitate to take the help from wherever it is available so that I'm able to draw these specifications for the kind of equipment that I aspire to buy. And in this league only, I would also include the vendors. I mean, contact with vendors is not a bad thing per se. It is not a question of to be or not to be. It is a question of our intent. And how do I draft the specifications without the help of the vendors, without the help of manufacturers who may be able to tell me what is the uh, use of particular uh, specification or use of particular item in a whole complicated biomedical equipment, whether this is the requirement that I need to have, or this is the thing that will be beneficial to me in my setting. And they are also involved in a lot of research and development. And for that research and development, they require our feedback the user's feed, unless and until I'm able to tell them that what is exactly my requirement, what was the problem with the previous thing that I was using, or what was the advantages that the previous thing I was using, how would the company or how would the manufacturer know what exactly I'm trying to ask for? I mean, I just cannot expect that whatever I think in my mind will be available in the market. And for the technology that is rapidly changing, and each manufacturer is trying to outdo each other, needs feedback from us. Needs, unless until we provide feedback, 
they will not be able to serve us. And that is where we need to be in contact with the manufacturers. They, can, they are not an isolated. They're also part of the same ecosystem in which we are working. And that is where their help is required. However, we must guard against the market-driven specifications that I said previously, the market-driven demand, and so is the market-driven specifications. Everyone will say that my product is the best. These are the advantages of my product over XYZ uh, products available in the market. But do I require those advantages? Actually, do all those advantages even exist? Or are they only superficial just to attract my attention? I'll give you a small example. We all use smartphones now. 95% of the people do not use 95% of the features of a smartphone. Right? Yet, how the smartphones are advertised in the uh, media nowadays? It is based on two things, sound quality and camera quality. But what was the original purpose of a phone? It was to communicate with each other. And, uh, but what is the marketing uh, force behind it? The camera quality and the sound quality. I mean, see, what is, our, what is my requirement and what is being sold to me based on what premises? So this is also applicable to our purchases when we are trying to buy biomedical equipments. I mean, when we talk about resources, is 64 slice city inferior to 128 slice city? And if so, what? In which respect? And 128 slice city, is it inferior to 256 slice city? If so, in how, what respect? And do I gain any competitive advantage or any advantage if I switch, switch to 60, from 64 slides to 128 or from 128 to 256? Or is this some kind of a race where everybody is trying to acquire the latest technology? As I said, there is nothing like latest. It all depends on what is my requirement. For somebody uh, sitting in a psychiatry office, he does not require probably 256 slides. City. He only wants to distinguish whether there is an SOL or a space occupying lesion which is causing the symptoms, or is it a pure psychiatric problem? For that, it probably 16 slice CT would be good enough. But if I go on and tell the psychiatrist the advantage of 256 slice CT, I don't think it's uh, of any use to that fellow. But because it is market-driven, they may be forced to buy these kind of equipments. So what exactly need to be understood is that we have to create specifications, take help from everyone, including the manufacturer, but we have to be guarded against the market-driven specifications. And there, the next question comes, at least in the public sector, that common uh, thing that is the refrain that we should draft specifications which are generic in nature. And by generic, I mean that we that invites more and more competition, that invites fair pricing, that invites, because the competition will drive down the cost. And that is the key to your specifications that the specifications should be good enough to meet your requirements, but they should not be specific to one particular manufacturer. And once you have drafted generic specifications, inviting good competition, you can expect to drive down the price. You can expect to get a better deal. But if we face a lot of problems, especially when we are trying to buy equipment for surgeons and for cardiologists and all those people. They will come and uh, tell you that we have been trained on a particular equipment for a, on a particular uh, equipment of a particular manufacturer. I don't want to name those manufacturers and those equipments to drive any or to convey any uh, misconceptions. But they will say that I'm trained on X manufacturer's equipment or system, and that's why I'm com that's why I'm comfortable with that. So I only can work on that. So it's a very typical problem for a public sector as well as for corporate sector. Because in a public sector, at least in the bigger hospitals, we have four or five or six. We can afford to retrain if at all that is a requirement. In a corporate sector where you probably have one or two, and then you only buy that system that the, your, your surgeon is trained and the per surgeon leaves after one year or two years. What do you do with that system that you have? And the next surgeon that you hire, and he says, I'm not comfortable with that system. So you keep on changing those systems. So this will this, this opens up these questions where the the kind the way these things are done so that we we become dependent on the uh, equipment by brands it's not necessarily a bad thing also for certain things because 
uh, whenever I spoke to uh, surgeons, they would say, I would not, would not like to experiment on my patients. So there you have to keep a balance, whether the particular requirement is a genuine requirement or again, it has some interest which are not completely in the sync with the interest of the organizations. So these are the key questions that we need to answer when we are drafting our specifications. And that is how we will probably avoid certain pitfalls. Uh, all th this may sound uh, a bit uh, idealistic that how can we do this? And it is very difficult to follow all these things. But I can tell you that uh, this is the specification writing process. I'll skip this. This is there in the presentation you can share with the participants. But this is where I want to bring your attention to. Uh, two years back, I was trying to buy a car for myself. Now, imagine the kind of research that I did when I was trying to buy a car and the kind of research that we do when I'm trying to buy an equipment for my organization. See the quality of research and the kind of money that is involved. So if, when I look at the uh, specifications uh, for a car that I wanted to buy a subcompact SUV, see the kind of specifications that are there for a particular car. And I looked at each specification, uh, dimensions, capacity, brakes, safety, braking traction, lock and security, telematic seat, storage, exterior, everything before I decided to buy a particular vehicle. Do I pay that much attention when I'm trying to buy an equipment for my organization? There is a very huge list of specifications that are drafted, but do I understand the meaning of each and every word that is written? It's more like that insurance policy where a lot of things are written in very small letters and we do not even understand. So same is the case here. Now that we have spent so much time on the specifications, the key message about specifications is specify what you need, not how to get what you need. Look to increase competition, not to reduce it. Be as flexible as possible without compromising the objective and be clear. Unless until I am clear in my mind, I cannot convey the same clarity to the vendors or to the prospective vendors. So once we have decided what is the, uh, what is we, what we are going to purchase once we have decided specifications, then the next process is the purchase process. The purchase process, be it any sector, be it the public sector, corporate sector, or even for your homes also. The key three principles is the competition, transparency, and economical. What I'm trying to do here is to invite competition. The more the competition, the better the price the organization will get. It should be transparent. There should be no iota of doubt on the process because these processes, especially of purchasing the equipments, takes a long time. And if a questions are raised, and we all see newspapers where questions are raised, why this equipment was purchased, uh, were there some ulterior motives? All these things have to be taken care of. The process should be transparent so that and nobody can raise a finger of doubt on the process itself. And the process needs to be economical. I mentioned the example of the uh, various versions of CT scan. I need to understand what is the most economical thing that I can buy for my organization. And that will include all those analyses like break-even analysis or cost-effective analysis, cost-benefit analysis. The organization has to decide what it's going to do and what is the best price for it. Now, coming to the price, coming to the cost, uh, please remember that the cost is not a cross-sectional cost. It's a longitudinal cost that we are looking at. And while onto the process of purchase itself, in a government sector, we purchase it in a two-bit system where technical evaluation is done separately and financial evaluation is done separately. But while doing the financial evaluation, please look at it, whether it's a cross-sectional cost that we are considering or it's a longitudinal cost we are considering. The cross-sectional cost, by cross-sectional cost, I mean, what is the cost that has been quoted by the vendor? So the vendor may cost may, may, may quote you X amount of money and the next vendor will cost you X plus one, the third one will be X plus two. But I have to decide what is the most economical for the whole purchase that I'm making. And it involves a longitudinal cost. And by longitudinal cost, I mean the cost of running the equipment. And that includes your cost of consumables. That includes the cost of electricity. That includes the cost of human resources. That includes the cost of space. That includes the cost of installation. Everything should be factored in. Cost of CMC or AMC, cost of spares, 
everything should be factored in while deciding the final cost of equipment. I mean, uh, a lot of manufacturers try to enter into the organization through a surrogate method. They will offer you a free equipment or sometimes they will come through some NGO saying, we want to donate a particular equipment to you. We are very happy that somebody is donating an equipment to us and it's free of cost, but nothing is free in this world. There are no free lunches. The systems are closed. So the consumables you have to buy from that particular organization. Now you have an equipment and the vendor can then quote whatever consumables, the price of consumables that the vendor wants to put. And then when you finally analyze it after two years or three years, it is a more uh, costly equipment than the uh, equipment that you could have bought along with all the uh, prices for the uh, consumables and everything. Nowadays with the very, very uh, equipments which consume a lot of electricity, which require uh, heating and ventilation requirements, which require uh, maybe your RO order, you have to factor in that cost also. And uh, nowadays, with, when we are we are now moving ahead, then we need to probably also consider sometimes in future the carbon credits and the environment sustainability also. However, the whole mood point is that please do not look at the cross-sectional cost, but look at the whole cost in a longitudinal fashion. And then we will come to know what is the actual life cycle cost of a particular equipment. And that should drive our decision, not the small incentives that, okay, you buy and you will get another computer printer or you can give it to you as a free uh, upgrade or whatever, because these are usually the closed systems. Once we have installed the equipment, once we have used it for the uh, for its life, and uh, then the uh, another part that comes in, uh, may I know what uh, how much time is left for me to speak further? Uh, we would just like to hear you continuing, sir. Your discourse okay. has been excellent, but uh, for uh, need of time, if you can wrap up, say, in the next two minutes or so, that would yeah, be Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. I have only two minutes left then. So no okay. problems. Right. So uh, once we have decided that the equipment has been installed, it has been utilized throughout the life, and then something that is amiss, in at least in public sector, is the condemnation. I mean, people just keep it away uh, for somebody else to take care of it, and if, if I can tell you the last uh, major nuclear accident that India faced was a Mayapuri uh, radioactive accident. And it happened because somebody bought a radioactive material in 80s, forgot about it, was sold to a scrap dealer in 2009 or so. He broke open, he exposed to radioactive illness or radioactive uh, radiations and the person died. That is why this is a process which is usually amiss. A lot of space is occupied and we all crib about that we do not have enough space to expand. In government sector, this is uh, driven by the GFR. Again, the conditions are very clear. These are the conditions in which uh, when, when, we, when you can condemn, there is a set procedure for it. Nowadays, there is a policy of buyback installed in a lot of purchases, corporate, uh, public sector everywhere. So I think we need to also look at it because this is also a part of uh, the whole purchase cycle. And probably this is the first part because once you free out the space, only then you can actually buy out a new equipment. Otherwise you will always run out of space and that is common. And, and in current situation, when we are very, uh, at least in bigger cities, we are short of space. I think frequent condemnation is very, very important. And uh, these are the methods of uh, uh, disposal of the material. With this, I thank the audience for a patient listening and I'm open to any question or we can discuss it later on. Thank you so much.